As an American, when we think of bad air quality, we, we picture like big cities like in, in China or India or you see the smog and so we just think, oh, it's so nice that we have good air quality in the US. Just because I don't see smog in Pittsburgh doesn't mean that within my home there isn't an air quality issue. My name is Michael Rubino. I'm on a personal mission to make sure you don't get sick inside your own home. I knew there was something wrong. I'm just so relieved there's something that you can do about it. Hello, Valerie. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to be here today. Welcome. And please, let's share your story a little bit because it's kind of incredible. You live in the U.S. today, but you, you you were out of the U.S. for a little while. Let's talk about what you were doing. Perfect. Thank you, Michael, for having me, by the way. Um, yeah, so I this is my first time living in the U.S. since college. So I'm now 36. So just to give a quick summary, after college, I really wanted to see Africa. It was like always on my bucket list. I didn't have a lot of money. So I took a one-way ticket to South Africa. I had a tent and a backpack, and I spent seven months and nine days backpacking across the entire length of the African continent by myself. Um, so I, no airplanes, but it was hitchhiking. I was taking cargo boats and trains and Every day was, was super amazing. And then after that trip, I moved to Ethiopia and I spent eight years there. And then my family and I just, yep, yeah, moved back to the U.S. two years ago. And now I'm in Pittsburgh. That's, that's incredible. So first off, kudos to you because I will tell you one thing that I have never done and, and honestly probably never will is put a backpack on and go traveling <laughs> through a country. And that is, that is I say kudos because... There's a lot of uncertainty um, that goes into that, right? Because for me, I have to, I'm the type of guy that has to have everything planned out. I'm going here mm -hmm. on this date and this time, and from the next day, I'm going here. And But when you're backpacking, there's, there's none of that. You're like, I'm getting there, and I'm going to figure it out while I'm there. Exactly. Is that right? It's, it, it's exactly that. And I would say African countries are some of the best places in the world to visit, but it is very hard to plan your trip there because – there's not a lot of things that are online, so you can't figure out which bus to take or where you're going to stay ahead of time. You figure it out when you land in that city, and then there's always a place to stay, but you won't know until you actually get there. So it taught me a lot about life and just going with the flow and knowing that things are always going to work out, but you do have to take that first step. So that's really inspired me in a lot of other areas of my life, too. Well, I've already decided that I want to – this is before we talked, by the way. Uh, I want to go to Africa next year. Um, I'm really, I'm really excited starting off in South Africa. I, I take, I, I go to multiple trips, so we'll probably take multiple trips, but I want to start in South Africa, get some safaris, mm -hmm. uh, really get to see the beautiful country. Um, I'm very excited about that. And you spent, was it eight years in Ethiopia? I did. So I'm, I'm obviously biased towards Ethiopia, but if you've never been to Africa, I do think South Africa is a great starting point and there are so many cool things to see. So I will, I'll write you an itinerary when you're ready to go. And I'll say that anybody who's been anywhere in Africa, they always go back. So it will not be your last trip. So I'm, I'm excited for you. That's really exciting. I will definitely take you up on that offer for an itinerary. So tell me a little bit about Ethiopia. Yeah, you know, we talked a little bit offline. Um, you know, there was a, some misinformation around Ethiopia and stuff like that. You, you spent eight years there. Uh, you met your husband there. Um, you fell in love with the place, obviously. So I would love to hear about your time there and then maybe your adjustment coming back to the U.S. after that. Yeah, no, great question. I loved Ethiopia. Um, if you are a coffee drinker, Ethiopia is the country that invented coffee. So I drank crazy amounts of coffee. My caffeine intake was off the charts. Um, they also have really good food. Um, so I became vegan when I was living in Ethiopia and they have lots of vegan options, super healthy. Everything's very natural. You feel like you're going to like a farmer's market every day with just like everything's naturally organic and, and delicious. And then the culture is amazing. They're very community centered. They have good music, good dancing. I really, I really enjoyed my time there. And then because my husband's Ethiopian and my son was born there, I know that we'll be going back, you know, every other year is hopefully our goal. Um, but going from eight years in Ethiopia with this really healthy, organic, natural food, and then when we came back to the U.S. two years ago, we have really struggled to, to find those kind of healthy options in the U.S. Um, and so it's definitely been an adjustment seeing 
having to read nutrition facts again because there's so much extra sugar or oil or chemicals added in the food here. Um, and just being careful about what my kids consume um, has, been, has been a challenge for us. Yeah, I mean, the quality of air we breathe in North America is not great. You know, studies from EPA and HUD show over the past, uh, over a 13-year span from 2006, 2019, the prevalence of water damage and mold went up for pretty much every single species with the exception of one. It tells us that homes are becoming more water damaged, more moldy, right? That's impacting mm -hmm. the quality of air we're breathing. And then we add on top of that the quality of food. Mm -hmm. So as you already mentioned, like we use a lot of sugars and, you know, seed oils and things of that nature that might not be so good for us. Whereas, you know, you eat cleaner outside of the country naturally. I mean, I, I haven't been to Ethiopia. I could only imagine how organic the food really is there. I mean, you know, going to Europe, which I've, I've done tons of trips to Europe so far, yeah, I could eat a bowl of pasta and feel fine, where if I eat a bowl of pasta here in America, I'm likely to be bloated and feel gross and probably gain weight. And so it's really interesting to see, um, you know, that, that transformation, but like, how does it affect your body? I mean, how do you, how do you feel compared to how you felt eating in Ethiopia? It's, it's honestly a challenge for a lot of reasons. I mean, one is when I looked at the cookies that we used to eat in Ethiopia, I had some and I compared them like to the sugar content of like a similar cookie from like Trader Joe's. Their Trader Joe's cookie, which is still healthier than alternatives, four times the amount of sugar. So it's just watching what my kids eat and just feeling like it's easier to gain weight in the U.S. without realizing that you're consuming these extra ingredients. And then as a vegan, when I was in Ethiopia, they have this grain called teff grain. It's like the tiniest grain in the world. They make a lot of, um, they make a dish called injera out of it. And it's off the charts in terms of calcium and iron. So I used to that, eat that every day. I come back to the U.S. and I started having low iron. And it was because I wasn't consuming enough iron all of a sudden. And so I have to be a lot more conscious about how to eat um, healthy and get all the minerals and vitamins I need. Um, so it, it's, it's funny how we, we tend to view... Ethiopian or other like African countries as like low in nutrition, but in reality, they actually have some of the most nutritious food, especially the ones that are um, close to their culture. And so it's, it's very interesting to see that I was actually living a healthier lifestyle when I was living in Africa than I, than I am in the U S and how much extra attention I have to spend now to it. Yeah. it's really interesting. You know, in the U S it's like, if you want to get enough iron intake, you're pretty much expected to eat meat because there's just mm -hmm. so little, sources of iron and a lot of our nutrition. Uh, whereas in Ethiopia, it sounds like you have this grain that was so high in calcium and iron. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm guessing that grain's not very easy to get here, uh, no. in the U S. Yeah, exactly. It's harder to get here. You can't make the same dish with it. So it's been a challenge. Um, and then I know we talked earlier too, that when we moved to the U S like the American dream, we wanted to own a house. So we were first time home um, buyers and my husband and I did not know what we were doing and we thought a fixer upper would be a great idea. Um, so we bought this fixer upper. It has no air conditioning. Um, we're starting to see that there's some water issues and all of a sudden I'm wondering, is this safe for our kids and what do we even have to look out for? And we know nothing. Um, you know, my husband's not American. I'm new back to the U S. So, so we were like, did we make a giant mistake and how do we know if our house is healthy or not? Yeah. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a test called the dust test. It is okay. a really, it's, it's a really simple at home test. It uses PCR technology, which I think we all know what it means for thanks to COVID. Uh, but it's DNA specific analysis. You're going to collect dust. You're going to send it into the lab. Lab's going to analyze it using that PCR machine. It's going to tell us all these different types of mold that might be present in your house. Now, why would we want to look at mold? Mold is like one of the common denominators for issues in our home. If I have mold, I probably have dust mites. If I have mold, I probably have bacteria issues. And so pretty much what we're looking at is we're looking at water damage that intrudes into the home 
or poor climatization inside the home. So too much humidity, for example, is also a problem. Not enough ventilation, for example, is also a problem. And so if I have these different problems that allow us mold to grow, I know I'm going to have other stuff, right? I'm going to have pests and I'm going to have potentially bats or rodents in my attics that also create issues from an air quality perspective and a health perspective. And I'll have dust mites and bacteria and all these different components, right? So mold becomes a common denominator. If we have too high levels of, of certain species of mold, helps us understand what might be occurring in the home. For example, it might have aspergillus, penicillium, you know, some of these molds that are usually considered allergenic can be a little confusing because allergenic means, okay, it's going to promote allergies, right? But some of these allergenic species of mold also can produce toxins, which are toxic, right? So... Yeah, it should be really classified as toxigenic. But, you know, we, we tend to lump things together and things get lost in context and translation. So what we want to do is we want to understand what types of molds do we have? Are these molds that typically grow in humid environments? We want to look for problems with humidity or ventilation. Or are these molds that typically require three to five days of moisture to grow? And we're looking for leaks and more longstanding systemic issues. And that kind of gives us the framework to figure out how do we take the next step. Usually the next step will be let's figure out where these problems are coming from, um, you know, getting the right professionals into the home to evaluate these problems, and then coming up with solutions to then fix them and, of course, remove the mold in the process. So that's kind of how it starts. I know that's pretty uh, complicated, right, and if you're not making notes and writing all this down. But when we start with the dust test, every test comes with a free consult I kind of guides you to the next step, explains what it all means and helps push you through. And so that's how you really get started on this guided process. And with that being said, you know, we'll create a healthy environment for you and your family who bought a fixer upper. And now you've got this, this blank canvas to go and fix that up. And by the way, I have never not lived in a fixer upper. Really? Um, okay. Cause we I were have, regretting it. And you know, it is, I think it was a lot more work than we realized. And, um, you know, when I think of mold, I think that I'm going to see like black mold all over the wall. So I'm like, oh, I don't have a mold problem because I don't see any mold. But when I hear you talking about these things like humidity, well, we don't have air conditioning at the moment. So, and we're in Pittsburgh, so it is humid. And then when you take a shower or a bath, the whole room is getting really moist. And then there's not really, besides opening a window, it doesn't leave as fast. Um, and then I know that we have water that's come through the ceiling before when my uh, daughter flushed a toy down the toilet. So, so I'm sure there's like a host of issues that we have that we don't know about because I can't physically see it. Um, but the air does feel stale sometimes. And yeah, having two kids, it really changes the way you think about health and it makes it a bigger yeah. priority than, you know, it probably, even though it is a priority for anybody, when you have kids, it, it makes it feel urgent and something that you want to take care of faster. Oh, I totally agree. I have two kids myself, you know, eight and five, and you know, they, there's no shortage of things that they do that I have mm -hmm. to constantly clean up after, make sure that they're not creating yeah. more harm than good. Um, the reality of you know what you're saying is, you know, you you basically said I'm glad I you know I'm glad I I wasn't the only one to buy a fixer upper because sometimes <laughs> it feels overwhelming. You know, the reality of it is um, you could be one of the top experts in the world and you don't have x-ray vision, right? So you don't, you'll never fully know what you're getting yourself into until you get yourself into it because it's not like when I'm buying a house, they're going to let me start drilling holes in the wall and, you know, seeing behind walls, right? Um, right. So I have to, I have to use the tools that I have. I don't have x-ray vision and I've got to make an educated decision on, okay, is this house going to be fixable within a reasonable budget or time frame. And so that's what I have to do. And I'll tell you, two of the four walls on this house, I had to literally rebuild. I mean, like oh, tear no. the wall out, all the wood and rebuild. Like that's literally half the exterior of the house. Right. And I did, I had to do that because I saw some rusted nails at the bottom. When I remove, I was removing the baseboards. I was changing the floor because it was like laminate on slab, and mm -hmm. there was the slab wasn't sealed. And I was like, you know what? Let's just tile this, right? So I'm removing the baseboards to go and tile it, and I found rusted nails. That's the most subtle sign, right? 
Oh. I go, okay, we got rusted nails. That means there's moisture. Rust equals moisture, right? So let's let's take a look. As I open the wall, I find nothing but termite damage and mold and water damage and all kinds of crazy things. And so then I'm like, great. So I had to bring in the contractor. We're looking at it and you know, we're poking the wood and we're like, yeah, this, this, this wood, this, you know, we have a very heavy roof cause it's a tile roof. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, I, we have to rebuild this wall. Like it's far too, too damaged by termites and wood rot and water damage. Um, so it's like, even if I remove the mold from the wood, we would still have this issue of structural integrity. And mm -hmm the other side of the house that happened as well. So it was literally both the left side and the right side of my house. And it just doesn't stop there because if I redo the framing, the house was a stucco house. Now I had to redo the stucco, right? Two oh things goodness. I didn't realize when I bought the house, I'd have to do. I was like, I know I'm going to do a new roof. I know I'm going to replace all the doors and windows, but I didn't think I had to redo the stucco uh -huh. at least, at least, you know, not the, the whole house. Right? right. And I didn't think I would have to rebuild these walls. So what did that cost me? Oh, that was that that one discovery was like one hundred fifty thousand dollars. OK, oh, no. you know, and it's like and that's like that's like because I had to bring in other people and other companies and pay just like anybody else would. Right. It's not like I can do it all right. myself. And so I had no choice. Um, I know as people listen to this, like this happens all the time. This happens to my clients all the time where they're, you know, they, we start opening things up and it's Pandora's box and that and can how happen. Do we prevent this? Like when we were buying a home last year, were there things we could have tested the house for to know if there was moisture problems before we bought it? Yeah. I mean, you know, we had a home inspector. I had a mold inspector, right? Okay. You know, there, there were no signs until the baseboards were removed. They we're not able to just drill through holes and find it. So unfortunately, this is where I drew the short, the short straw. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it happens that in hindsight, I'm still glad I bought the house. You now I had okay. to basically, I had to basically refinance my loan to account for the additional money that I didn't have because I had a budget. Like everybody has a budget when they take on such a project. So I had to refinance and just make it work. Um, it sucked, but at the end of the day, I've got a beautiful, healthy home. It's, it's literally built like how I want it. I designed right. the whole thing myself. I love the way it looks. My family loves the way it looks. They're happy. I know it's healthy because I literally ripped it apart to fix it. Um, right. And I know it's future proofed, right? So I've got all new hurricane doors and windows. I live in Florida, so you, you got to have that because of the hurricanes that come here. Um, I've got, you know, t all new tile on the slab, so I don't have any concerns about water intrusion there. Um, any window that, w all the windows have been replaced, so I'm not worried about any new leaks because I had them all mm -hmm. new construction windows with proper flashing the last, you know, decades. Mm -hmm. um, so, I've, I've, it's, I call it the fortress because it's, it's a fortress. Now I've got dehumidifiers in place. I'm controlling the humidity here. I've got good filtration systems in my HVAC units. Like I've done everything you can do to prevent it. But the question is like, how do you prevent it? Well, right. it's making sure your roof's in good shape. It's making sure the doors and windows are in good shape. It's making sure the exterior's in good shape. You know, like for example, the stucco, right? I ended up having to redo a lot of the stucco. Now this house was built in the eighties. So it was literally just stucco on top of tar paper, right? Oh, there was my. no modern waterproofing. So I got to remodernize the waterproofing, uh, across the house. Right. So now it's, it's like having a 50 year shelf life all over again. Right. Unfortunately, yeah. like houses cannot be built to prevent water forever. Okay. Houses are going to move and shake. They're going to shift. Things will crack. Water barriers will go bad over time. Nothing lasts forever, right? So unfortunately, it's it's about like understanding how long ago things were, were done and mm -hmm. understanding the shelf life of those things. Like a door and window, honestly, if you get 30 years out of them, out of the waterproofing elements, like you should be happy. Right. Um, I actually 
actually makes me feel better because for a long time we gave ourselves a hard time. Like, what were we thinking when we bought this house? But it is good to know that like, it doesn't last forever and you can fix it one time. It might be like painful and expensive, but then once you fix it, like I'm sure you sleep well at night because you know that your family is healthy. Whereas I'm still like, huh, I wonder if that leak is going to cause mold that I can't see. Like, that's always like what I think about. Um, oh, I know. So it's really good to know. We had a rent a place while we were dealing with like finding this house and like renovating this house. And like, we were sick all the time. I was getting, oh. I was getting like the flu, like three or four times a year. Mm-hmm. Now I, I like, if I get sick, it's like once a year max, right? I'm wow. like never sick. I get, cause yeah. it, I think it, air quality matters a great deal in, in health and wellness because the more crap that's coming in or on your body, the more your body has to fight to remove it. Right. Mm. And so from that perspective of, having, you know, being healthy. I mean, you know, I am not the, I'm not at my desired weight, right? I, um, despite exercising, you know, the problem is, is that the quality of food that I eat, I think even though it's good quality food from the standards of trying to stay away from processed foods, not eating too many carbs, I guess still just not the greatest quality like you we've already talked about this we right. go outside the country and we thrive right yeah um, like it's crazy a restaurant near you and start eating that every night i know like it's crazy <laughs> so i you know it's like i do the best that i can but unfortunately i'm you know it's i'm a human being and i get invited to go out to eat all the time and it's like peace stop inviting me to go out to eat because every time i do that it's like i'm completely off track even if i do my best at eating right i could eat a salad but it just happens to be that that salad's like 3,000 calories, right? Because you're eating out instead of making right. a salad at home, right? And so, you like, know you never I know. In Ethiopia, is I walked a lot more naturally, whereas in the U.S., you don't walk as much. So you even if you exercise, it's like 30 minutes out of your day. The rest of the day, you might be sitting. Whereas in Ethiopia, I was walking to the bus. All the stores are walkable. It's like a very transit city like it's transit friendly. So you're just moving a lot more. So you don't even have to try and exercise as much. And I think that's another thing that makes it harder in the U S It's just, we're, we're just sitting a lot more than other countries are. That's true. You know, especially a lot of us post COVID, we work from home too. Mm-hmm. And so you, you know, it just, you've got this American lifestyle, you've got this work from home stuff going on. So we're, we're sitting down, we're at our desk. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not walking as much. Um, thankfully, I have Apple devices with that little health app that tells me how many steps I do. So I'm always pushing myself okay. to stand up, Amazing. walk around, things like yeah. that. When I'm on calls, I like I will pace around out either outside or like walking around my living room or something just yeah. to like, you know, try to get That's as much smart. activity as possible. But it's, you know, you have to be conscious of these things. And mm-hmm. um and even with trying as hard as you can, it still gets really difficult and I think Part of the problem here in America is you know, the quality of air we're breathing. It's like it's just not on anyone's radar. I mean, mm-hmm. I would only I would only imagine going to Ethiopia. You've got a lot more ventilation. You've got a lot more fresh air. You've got you know the beautiful outdoors to enjoy, right? And so, you know, it's it's just a better situation. You coming here, being cooped up into these homes, which of which mostly are sick homes. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's tough. I agree. And I think when we think of, as an American, when we think about air quality, we, we picture like big cities like in, in China or India, or you see the smog. And so we just think, oh, it's so nice that we have good air quality in the US. But uh, the more I listen to your shows, the more I realize just what a problem it is here. And it's been it's been really helpful for me to see that, yeah, just because I don't see smog in Pittsburgh doesn't mean that within my home there isn't an air quality issue. Yeah, and you know, we we kind of already hit the nail on the head, but we spend ninety percent of our time indoors, right? We are an indoor generation, and if our air quality inside is no good, it could be beautiful outside. Unless we're spending all of our time outside, you know, we're not going to feel the benefits of that, and so we're going to mostly feel the effects, and usually they're negative effects of the quality of air we're breathing inside our homes. And so, you know, it's, it's being aware of it so that you can do something about it. Cause one of the things like, I think it's everybody knows is you can't fix problems that you don't know exist. Right. right. And so if you're aware that the quality 
indoors is not great, you can do something about it. And we kind of talked about, well, how do we start that journey to figure out the problem and do something about it? And so I'm excited to see your dust test results when they come in. And I'm excited. I'm kinda, nervous. <laughs> it, yeah, it could be a little nerve wracking, but you know, if we look at it, the information is going to empower us to make decisions, mm -hmm. then that that's, that's where it's at. I mean, I understand there's a cost associated with fixing things, right? And that is usually where the overwhelm sets in. But at the end of the day, you know, again, if we don't make positive changes, you know, we continue to get sick and Right. What's what's the cost of that? And exactly. that's where we have to really rationalize. And, you know, I, we have changed the air foundation a 501 C three nonprofit doing amazing work with education policy reform, because I understand that there are people that cannot afford physically to do anything. And that's where we need better policies in place and better protections in place so that they're not in harm's way and backed into a corner with no options. Right. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess at the end of the day, one, one phrase that's always helped me is like, choose your hard. So it, it's hard to send in a dust test because I'm afraid there might be a lot of work and I, that's gonna be hard to fix it. But it's also harder to have the flu all the time and to feel sick and to be worried about my kids. So it's like, if I have to choose a hard situation, I'd rather just get it over with and fix it than to continue to live in it. Yeah. I mean, cause you, you could fix these things and that they are fixable. Uh, so I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of outside of the health space here, uh, you're doing really amazing work. Um, and it's really exciting to see, and I really want you to introduce your company and what inspired you to create this company and what you're, what you're hoping to accomplish. Yeah, thank you. So I'm the founder and CEO of Cradle. And basically I had a degree in social work. So when I first went to African countries, I was thinking about doing um, like a nonprofit or a charity. But the more I did that backpacking trip and the longer I lived in Ethiopia, I realized that a lot of charities, especially the US, one, US ones, they don't do what you think that they're doing on the ground. And I realized that the biggest problem is that there's just not jobs in Africa to the extent that it's needed. And so I started getting involved in outsourcing when I was living in Ethiopia. So we were working for large companies like McDonald's and MasterCard and, and these large Fortune 500 companies. And overnight, we would create jobs. They needed customer service reps or cold callers. And we'd be hiring 20 people, 50 people, 100 people and more. And it, it, it was really cool to see the win-win that it created both in terms of creating jobs for the African professionals and also um, just providing some extra support for the U.S. companies. And most people, when they hear outsourcing, they think that's taking jobs away from Americans. But what I have found is American companies just wouldn't hire for those positions. And so when you do a hybrid model where you're hiring some offshore team members to support your internal team, your internal team thrives, your business makes more money, you can be a more competitive employer because you can offer some time off knowing that you have back-end support. So I just became in love with this idea of connecting um, African professionals as remote team members for U.S. companies. But I wanted to do it um, not just in Ethiopia, but all throughout Africa. So when I created Cradle, I was really open to hiring anywhere in the African continent. And I knew that I wanted to pay better than I've seen other outsourcing companies do. And because it's COVID, and that's when I kind of launched it, I allowed people to work from home. Um, and I really, I really wanted to help more U.S and other people around the world see that Africa isn't what we think it is. It's not pity. It's not poverty. It doesn't need charities. And what it needs is um, win-wins. And so I love the idea of just connecting African professionals to, to U.S. jobs. And that's what I do. And so as of next week, we'll have about 100 people that we've hired, um, connected them to U.S. companies. And it's really cool. And I'm hoping to launch a movement where every U.S. company sees the benefit of hiring from Africa and we create these really cool ethical jobs and it becomes a win-win. And hopefully through that, we can also change our narrative of the continent because it's pretty off base from what I've seen and, and just create win-wins. And um, working with you guys has been one good example of how you can do that and how it can be helpful in a win-win. Yeah, and I'm glad to be one of part of the 100 and part of the solution. <laughs> Um, just to give people an understanding of, you know, what things used to be like and why you created this, 
can you highlight a little bit of the, um, you know, how, how, how companies have come in and have really taken advantage and not provided fair wages? Um, mm -hmm. Because I think that, I think that's a missing element that really uh, strengthens what you were trying to do. Right, exactly. So a lot of these large Fortune 500 companies end up paying about 50 cents an hour to like the Ethiopian team members that they're hiring. And to be fair, a lot of the African professionals who start getting 50 cents an hour, it's their first job. So that is the most amount of money they've made. It could be more than what their parents made, but it's not sustainable with the cost of um, goods rising with inflation. And so you find them doing these jobs for these large companies. And then on the side, they're doing Uber and three other side hustles. And a lot of the reason why these companies are paying so low is because they're going through so many middlemen. So they hire a company who hires a company who finally finds the Ethiopians. And so those middlemen are taking a lot of the money. And so there's just a need for like a better direct match. And then at the end of the day, when you are paying better, the job retention is also better. So that's something we're really proud of is that when people get a job at Cradle, they stick around and they provide like that long term um, commitment to the U.S. companies. Um, and, and the stories are really cool. Like people are going back to grad school with the money. They are able to stay together as a family. They're paying for the younger sibling school. So it's really cool to see just how jobs really reduces poverty. And then at the end of the day, you get the coolest team member out there um, who's, you know, a really good match for your company and feels just like any other team member. Um, so yeah, so that's what we've been doing. It's, it's just the beginning, I would say. Yes, that that's and I'm very excited to see you and I'm behind you and uh, watch you grow and, and, and be so helpful uh, across the world. I mean, we are in a we are more in a global society than we've ever been. You know, the, when I when I talk about statistics of our health, I talk about it on a global scale. And the reason being is, you know, first off, we're all connected today with things like social media. I mean, we are we, we, we know more about each other and what we're going through across the world than ever before. Sometimes there's misinformation, obviously, and we have to clear that up. But I would say for the most part, you know, we, we are more connected than ever before. Um, and, you know, I love to travel. I love to go to different places. I love to meet different people from different places all over the, all over the world, uh, understanding people's culture. I study different religions to understand, you know, what different people believe and what, what they believe in, and all for the sake of being connected with one another, because we've got some global issues, right? Um, mm -hmm. Poverty, obviously, being one in, in certain areas of the world. Uh, we've got air quality and, and the global health crisis happening across the world. We've got, you know, places that can't afford food. We've got places that can't afford uh, medicine and all these different things that occur and we want to be more helpful towards one another on a global scale. Right. And I know, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the U S sometimes we, we think it's unpatriotic to help other people, um, outside of the U S I don't mm -hmm. believe that. I believe that, you know, it's, it's our duty as a world superpower to help those in need across the world. And to see what you're doing is really exciting. Um, and, and I, I really applaud you for doing something like this because I know, I know fortune 500 companies have come in and tried taking advantage. You're actually coming mm -hmm. in and saying, no, you know what, we're going to make this right and pay, you know, fair wages so people can mm -hmm. actually earn a living. And for me, it's like one of the reasons why I, I love this idea and I support it is because I think for one, um, it, I'm a little biased here, but we're going to be educating people in Africa on the importance of air quality and how that connects to, to the global health crisis. Um, I think that is really remarkable because I will tell you there's been a lot of knowledge coming out of the U S but when you start to look at Europe, you start to look at other continents, uh, we're, we're struggling. I mean, mm -hmm. Australia is really the only other, uh, you know, um, place that I've seen actually come out and start talking about water damaged buildings, the impact of health and air quality. Mm -hmm. um, cancer research in UK has started to talk about air pollution being one of the largest leading causes of cancer next to smoking. However, they're being very general and they're not talking about indoor air quality, which is where, again, people spend most mm -hmm. of their time. And so I'm on a global mission, not just, you know, here in the U.S., and being able to even play a small part in helping you uh, achieve your mission and, you know, being able to support people 
um, into better situations in life and mm-hmm. it be, be educational and supportive in their personal growth. And also in the awareness piece of this global health crisis. I mean, it's a no brainer for me. And so thank you, you know, thank you for, for doing what you do and, and all of that. And you, you also connect people with African made products, right? Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. I, I was just really passionate about job creation and um, also coffee lovers. So um, there's been quite a bit of work where we've connected coffee farmers to um, U.S. buyers as well. So that's been rewarding. Again, I'm just keeping my caffeine addiction going <laughs> strong. Um, but I, I would say when you're talking about air quality in African countries, one issue I've heard a lot in Ethiopia is um, there is a lot of cancer actually forming because as women are cooking with fires inside the home, that smoke is causing more cancer and it is impacting women more than than the men because they still tend to do more of the cooking. And so there's been a lot of needs around that. So I would be so interesting to see where you go in the future and if that's like another issue you can help tackle. Um, but that's something I've, I've heard a lot about. Um, and I would say just in terms of how we when I told my mission to you and your team, you guys were so open um, to hiring someone from Africa. You guys really embraced the mission and you knew that just hiring extra people allowed you to serve more people. And um, every yeah. in every way that you guys have taken care of, um, her name's Mandy, she's from Zimbabwe, she's on your team. Um, you guys have just been so kind and, and so lovely to her. And it was just wonderful to see that not only do you care about like, healthy homes, but you care about healthy work culture and you're, it's just amazing to see how you, you walk that in every different way. So, um, yeah, you guys are one of the companies we love working with. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's great to hear. I mean, I think it's, it's all about community and mm-hmm. you know, when you're trying to help communities of people, you, you also, like, you can't tell your employees, I want you to go and help these families, but I don't want you to help yourself. Mm. Right. And so it's about building communities where everybody's rewarded for the help that they go out and, and provide and being able to make a, a living through doing the work, helping other people. Mm-hmm. And that's what it's about. There's a there's this powerful book that I read. It's called The Healing Organization by these two amazing authors. And, you know, I, I feel like one of the things companies have it a little backwards, especially American companies. I mean, I feel like we've been bashing America here, but uh, I know. You know, there, there are some things that we have to improve upon people. That's all I'm trying to say. Um, th- especially when you look at companies, you know, it's, it's more about profits. And when we prioritize profits over people, we get into a situation where people are dying mm-hmm. and it, it, it's, it's, it shouldn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. And so when we build homes, we're prioritizing profits over people. And that's why homes are, are leaking and have water damage and aren't built properly. When we prioritize you know, profits over people, we've got a pretty unstable healthcare system uh, like we mm-hmm. have here in the US. Um, we've got uh, relatively high tax burdens with not great returns on said taxes. Um, you know, we've got this sick system. And so I think what we really need to do, and this is really all about the book of healing organization is, you know, I think we do a lot of reliance on governments to solve our problem. And if we look at history, relying on the government to solve our problems has never worked out well. Mm -hmm. And so when the people come together through communities to solve problems, we thrive and that's what we have to remember. And we have to not let history repeat itself. We have to go to these moments where we won. And we have to remember why we won. Mm-hmm. And we win in a community setting. And so I look at what we do as a company. Um, you know, I, I'm not the CEO of the company any longer. Um, you know, John is, and he's have, has done a fantastic Hi, job. John. Yeah, shout out to John. I, <laughs> you know, I'm good at, I am good at, you know, the process side of things, the system side of things. I am good at, you know, creating a culture. I am good at setting the integrity and the vision of the company. But, you know, it it is a lot to do day-to-day operations. Mm -hmm. And someone like me, you need help, right? And so Mm -hmm. um, I needed help. And so I, I, I found that in John. And the culture is so important because it's about community. Mm -hmm. And I think that is really what it comes down to. And if you don't feel part of a community, 
um, then we don't have part of a community at home. And, you know, it's, it's kind of sad, but the, the community has been lost a little bit over the years. Um, right. and I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make, at least do my part in making a comeback by building the communities that I can around me. And that starts with work. It starts at home. It starts with friends and the groups that I'm part of and the nonprofit work that I do. And, you know, I, I think it's really important and, and being able to connect with one another and have gratitude for what we're trying to accomplish together and the support that we each need as people. That's where I think we, we, we thrive from here. And so hopefully um, those listening, if you haven't read the book, The Healing Organization, please do so. But yeah. through that community, it's giving back and creating the products and solutions that give back that Mm -hmm. prioritize people over profits. And you know, it's actually really interesting, but if you prioritize people over profits, you get profits anyway. Exactly. And they're sustainable profits. And if we, because we've been bashing America a little bit, let me say one good thing in the U S is that starting a business in the U S is so easy and paying taxes in the U.S. is actually very fair that in, and easy compared to what I've seen in other countries. And so one thing I, I'm very passionate about is how can you use business for good, like conscious capitalism kind of model. And so you're a great example of like starting a business that does good in this world. And that's just the vehicle for creating the communities and creating the health. And that's very much how I see Cradle as well, is we are a business. We're not... Um, we do have profits. We do, you know, make it a strong business, but we have an impact that, that leads us and guides us along the way. So it's, you can choose business and you can choose, um, business and social impact and you can have a healthy home and, and get set up. So it's like, people don't have to choose and you really can have both. And that's the cool thing. I, I totally agree. You know, there are a lot of things you can do in life to earn money. And if you can earn money, making an impact, That is the best way to earn money because you're helping people in the process. And, you know, we've had so many years of corruption of different companies, like I said, prioritizing profits over people. And and when you get into that that swing of things, you're just putting people in harm's way. And the result is, you know, it it obviously impacts the economy because, again, people getting sicker, they're not working. They're on disability. The health care costs are rising, so it makes it harder to get health care coverage in the first place. Like, exactly. There are massive systemic issues that are created when we prioritize mm-hmm. profits over people. And so if you can profit by making an impact. Please do so. Agreed. Agreed, yeah. I hope people listening to this... Um, yeah, see that, see that you can have good companies, you can do good things, prioritize people, prioritize health, get a dust test through your company, which is what I'll be doing right after this. <laughs> yes, exactly. There are things we can do to do better. Um, you know, Valerie, I want to thank you so much for coming on today's show. You know, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, this is not a typical episode of Never Been Sicker, but I'm so proud of what we're able to talk through today and give this information out. And you know, if you're listening and you've been inspired and you want to help Valerie on her mission to employ professionals from Africa, buy African products, please do so. Uh, please get in contact. How can they get in contact with Cradle and you? Definitely. So our website is cradle.com and that is spelled C-R-D-L-E. So Cradle without the A. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn every day. I'm posting content that's helpful for anybody who wants to have remote team members, whether that's in Africa or somewhere else. I give a lot of tips on how to do it. So you can find me Valerie Bowden on LinkedIn and I'd love to connect with people there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to be here with us. Uh, it was really an amazing episode. We covered so many unique things that I get, like we probably will never get to cover again on this show. So thank you for, for being here. Thank you.